ഹലോ ഹായ് ഐ എം ബഷീർ അസിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് പ്രൊഫസർ എക്കണോമിക്സ് കൽപ്പറ്റ ഗവൺമെൻറ് കോളേജ് ടുഡേ ഐ ആം ഹിയർ വിത്ത് യു എ ന്യൂ ടോപ്പിക് ഫ്രോം ഇൻ്റർനാഷണൽ എക്കണോമിക്സ് ഹെക്സ് റോയൽ ഇൻ ട്രേഡ് തിയറി ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ആൾസോ നോൺ ആസ് ദി മോഡേൺ തിയറി ഓഫ് ഇൻ്റർനാഷണൽ ട്രേഡ് ദിസ് ടോപ്പിക് ഈസ് വെരി ഹെൽപ്പ്ഫുൾ ഫോർ ദി സ്റ്റുഡൻറ്റ് ഹു ആർ ഡൂയിങ് മാസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ഇൻ ഇക്കണോമിക്സ് ആൻഡ് ആൾസോ ദ വൺ ഹു പ്രിപ്പയർ ഫോർ വേരിയസ് കോമ്പറ്റേറ്റീവ് എക്സാംസ് റിലേറ്റഡ് ടു എക്കണോമിക്സ് സോ വെൽക്കം ടു ദി വീഡിയോ now coming to the topic the classical trade theories developed by adam smith ricardo and j s mill was based on the differences in the productivity of labor or a single factor this theory failed to provide an adequate explanation for why there is such differences in the productivity of labor though reading from this theory we can get an insight like relative cost differences or relative differences in commodity prices between two trading countries as an evidence of their comparative advantages but what is the fundamental causes for the commodity price differences that is not answered in the classical trade theory so the theory for analyzing the pattern of international trade was developed by swedish economist hexter in 1919 and his student ohlin in 1933 was made an attempt to deal with this important questions in fact this theory did not replace the traditional comparative cost theory rather than supported it by providing explanation for relative commodity price differences between the trading countries and their respective comparative advantages so according to them the differences in the commodity prices arises on account of the differences in the factor endowment or factor supplies in these trading countries ef hexter in his work on the effect of foreign trade on the distribution of income which was published in 1919 and later by his student p ohlin in his work on interregional and international trade published in 1933 has laid the foundation for the development of modern theory of international trade that is why this theory is known as hexter oil in trade theory you know this theory has almost completely replaced the classical and neoclassical theories related to international trade nevertheless it goes behind the comparative cost doctrine to investigate the basic cause of the relative differences in cost You know, Hexel and Ohlin have traced the cause of the cost differences to relative factor endowments and relative factor intensities. That is why this theory is also known as factor proportion or factor intensity theory. Thus, in terms of factor endowment, this theory can be stated like this. A nation will export the commodity to whose production requires the intensive use of the nation's relatively abundant and cheap factor and import the commodity whose production requires the intensive use of the nation's relatively scarce and expensive factor the general proposition of the ho theory is that the countries which are rich in labor will export labor intensive goods and those rich in capital will export capital intensive goods having said this uh, now let us see what are the various underlying assumptions of the ho theory uh, the following five assumptions are very essential for the analysis of ho theory these are uh, there are no transportation cost or other impediments to the trade and uh, there is perfect competition in both commodity and factor markets all production function are governed by constant return to scale or homogeneous of first degree and the production functions are such that the two commodities shows different factor intensities and it is also assumed in the theory that the production function differ between commodities but are the same in both countries that is good a is produced with the same technique in both countries and good b is produced with the same technique in both countries these assumptions are not difficult to understand in fact 
the first assumption is an abstraction to facilitate the analysis. It means that commodity prices under trade will be the same in both countries. The meaning of the second assumption is clear in the sense that the factors of production will be allocated in an optimal way. And the last three assumptions all refers to the characteristics of production function. So, the third assumption like the production function being linearly homogeneous implies that production is governed under constant return to scale. And the fourth assumption which means the different technique of production are used in the two industries. Furthermore, we can say that it is assumed there is a one to one correspondence between factor intensities and factor prices. Another way of stating this fact is by saying that there are no factor reversal. The last assumption that production functions are the same in both the countries is a quite strong one. What it amounts to is assuming that knowledge travels freely. In other words, the best techniques of production in the world are known to everyone. So, these are the assumptions used in connection with the exeroiling theory of trade. They are necessary to state the meaning of combative advantage in the 2 by 2 by 2 model and to prove the factor price equalization theorem that we will discuss in the later. Now, we will demonstrate the proposition that capital rich countries export capital intensive goods and labor rich countries export labor intensive goods. So, it is however not yet clear what is mean by country being rich in capital. At least two different definitions can be given. So, one of these definitions runs in terms of factor prices. This definition says that country 1 is capital rich compared to country 2 if capital is relatively cheaper in country 1 than in country 2. The second definition compares overall physical amount of labor and capital. It says that country 1 is rich in capital if the ratio of capital to labor is larger in country 1 than in country 2. These two alternative definitions are not equivalent in fact. We will now show that the Hetzer-Oilin proposition follows if we use the first definition, but that it does not necessarily follow using the second definition. In fact, Oilin himself defined richness in factor endowment with the help of factor prices. So, according to this definition, country 1 is abundant in capital if P1 C to P1 L less than P2 C by P2 L, where P1 C is the price of capital in country 1, P1 L is the price of labor in country 1, and P2 C and P2 L are the prices in country 2 of labor and capital respectively. In other words, if capital is relatively cheap in country 1, the country is abundant in capital and if labor is relatively cheap in country 2, country 2 is rich in labor. Now, let us show that country 1 will export the capital intensive good and that country 2 will export the labor intensive good. This can be easily demonstrated with the help of this figure. We start with the two isocons AA and BB which characterize the production functions and are the same in both countries. So, according to this isocon, B is the labor intensive good and A is the capital intensive good. Relative factor prices in country 1 where capital is cheap are given by the line P0, P0. Let us assume that the isocons represent one unit of the respective good. Then one unit of good A will be produced with the OA1 of capital and OA-1 of labor, but capital and labor can be exchanged for each other in the ratio shown by the factor price line P0, P0. Therefore, OA-1 of labor is worth A1G of capital and 
O A one of capital is worth A dash one H of labor. We said that one unit of good A would be produced with O A one of capital and O A dash one of labor. But we can view the line G H as a cost line, and we can express the cost of producing one unit of A in terms of capital alone or labor alone. Doing so, we find that the cost of producing one unit of A is O G measured in terms of capital, or O H measured in labor. Having said this, the next step is to find out the cost of producing one unit of each good in country two. The only information we have about country two is that capital is relatively more expensive than in country one. This means that the slope of the line representing the ratio of factor prices in country two will be less steep than the slope of P zero P zero. Now, a possible factor price line in country two is P one P one. You can see that it is tangent to the A A isocond at E. You can also see that. A parallel factor price line is P to P two, which is tangent to the B B isocond at F. So it is obvious that P to P two must lie below the P one P one factor price line. So from this, it follows that the cost of producing one unit of good A in country two is O C measured in capital, whereas it is O D. Measured in capital for one unit of good B. Thus, in country two, it is more expensive to produce a given amount of good A than it is to produce the same amount of good B. If we now compare production costs in two countries, we find that it is relatively cheap to produce good A in country one and relatively cheap to produce good B in country two. So from this, it follows that country one will export good A and country two will export good B. This establishes the Hexer-Oehlin theory that the country abundant in capital will export the capital-intensive good, and the country abundant in labor will export the labor-intensive good. The starting from the definition of factor abundance in terms of factor prices, it is easy to establish the Hexer-Oehlin theorem. However, one could argue that stating the theorem in terms of factor prices is not very interesting, because factor prices are themselves result of a complicated interplay of economic forces. So they are, for instance, not only determined by supply side factors, but are also influenced by demand side factors. So it is not possible to say anything about factor prices from the knowledge of factor endowment alone. So to state the Hexer-Oehlin theorem in terms of factor prices gives perhaps not the most interesting version of the theorem. So a more natural definition, it seems, would run in terms of physical amounts. So let us use this definition and see what the result will be. So defining factor abundance in physical terms. We say that country one is rich in capital and country two is rich in labor. If C one by L one greater than C two by L two, where C one is the total amount of capital in country one, L one is the total amount of labor in country one, and C two and L two are the total amount of capital and labor respectively in country two. We will now show that if country one is abundant in capital according to this definition, it implies that country one has a bias in favor of producing the capital intensive good. The nature of this bias can be explained with the help of this figure, where it is assumed that good A is the capital intensive good and good B is the labor intensive good. If both countries were to produce the goods in the same proportion, say along the ray O R, country one would be producing at point S dash on its production possibility curve, and country two would be producing at point S on its production possibility curve. So the slope of the country one production possibility curve at S dash 
E is steeper than the slope of the country 2's curve at S. This implies that could A would be cheaper in country 1 than in country 2 and that could B would be cheaper in country 2 than in country 1 where the two countries producing at the respective points. So, this is also illustrated by the fact that the commodity price line P1 P1 is steeper than the price line P2 P2 means the opportunity cost of expanding production of good A is therefore lower in country 1 than in country 2 and vice versa for good B. This shows that country 1 the capital rich country has bias in favor of the capital intensive good from the production side and that the country abundant in labor country 2 has a bias in favor of producing the labor intensive good. However, it does not follow from this that the labor rich country will export the labor intensive good. It might be the case that the demand side factors more than offset the bias from the production side. Such a case we can illustrate with the help of this figure where uh, we can see that the same production possibility curve as our earlier figure and good A is still the capital intensive good and good B is labor intensive good. The differences is that now we have taken demand into account. Demand in the two countries is characterized by two set of indifference curves where the curves i dash 0, i dash 0 and i dash 1, i dash 1 etc represent demand in country 1 and the curves i double dash 0 uh, and i double dash 1 etc represent demand in country 2. Demand in country 1 is obviously biased towards the capital intensive good and demand in country 2 is biased towards labor intensive goods. Thus, in isolation or without trade, good A is relatively more of expensive in country 1 than in country 2. This is also shown by the fact that commodity price line P2 P2 in country 2 is steeper than the line P1 P1 that representing the relative commodity prices in country 1. So, from this it follow that when trade is opened up between the two country, country 1 will be exporting good B and country 2 will be exporting good A. In other words, the country abundant in capital will export labor intensive good and country abundant in labor will export the capital intensive good. So, to sum up, factor abundance can be defined in two ways in the hexaroline trade model. The two alternative definitions are not equivalent in fact, only according to the one of them does it follow that the country abundant in capital will export the capital intensive good and that the country rich in labor will export the labor intensive good. So, this is all about the HO model. I hope that you understood the theory. Okay, thank you. Thank you for watching. Okay.